Well, good morning, church family. How are you? Great. Thank you for being here, man. Very cool that you showed up this morning. I, again, you could be doing 50 different things today on a Sunday in Steamboat, but uh, being a part of uh, church here, coming and worshiping with us, thank you for being a part of that. My name is Troy. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, grateful that you joined us here in person. Also grateful all you that are watching online. Uh, glad that you'll be a part of that, and, but it's better in person. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Because uh, we have pulled pork sandwiches. Let me just <laughs> illustrate that. All right. So talk about the obvious. But uh, I just uh, want to just follow up with Kyle and Hadley and just say, man, last week was a, a, a huge week for our church. A couple things. Obviously, we had the first week of the Steamboat Christian Academy. They had a wonderful week here, man. And the students and teachers, very proud of that. And uh, great team over there. Good stuff coming out of that already. And then um, I didn't get a chance to talk about this like I wanted to last week. But um, I mentioned that uh, we, had, we sent... Steamboat Christian Center sent 20 people uh, down to Honduras, which is a very difficult nation right now, a lot of political issues, uh, a lot of uh, poverty, a lot of hurting people, and we sent 20 people down there to love on people and encourage them and to help uh, do some ministry, and uh, if you went to Honduras last week and part of that team, would you just raise your hand or stand up just so we can see? Yeah, let's give them a big hand for that. Um, Man, if you get a chance uh, today, maybe outside uh, where lunch is, uh, maybe talk to them and ask them how their trip was, because uh, I talked to Kyle. He said this is one of the best service trips that he'd ever been on, really impactful, every day, good stuff, making a lot of impact. So thank you for that, and thanks for sending them. Well, uh, today, uh, I'm glad you're here, because we're starting a brand new series. So you're here at the beginning of the movie, rather than coming in after it started or at the end. It's much better that way. Um, the series is called uh, Perfect Family. And I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I hope it's going to be fun and hopefully be encouraging and challenging to you. I mean, this is a topic that we're all kind of, uh, it affects us all because we all, uh, whether we like it or not, have a family, amen? <laughs> we all come from a family and have a family. And, uh, and so I thought what I'd do real quick is just tell you where we're headed so you can plan your calendar over the next few weeks. Uh, today is just an introduction to the series. We're just going to do an introduction. I'm not going to super go deep into something like that or all that. But so the truth is you're probably going to leave today with more questions than answers. But that's okay. Uh, we don't think in terms of sermons here. We think in terms of series. And we like to have a longer conversation about topics and let us dig into that. And so today is just an introduction to the series, but I believe that you'll get something out of this uh, that will hopefully you can noodle on throughout the week. Uh, next week, though, we're going to get really practical. What I'm going to do next week is I'm, I'm going to give you a question that you personally can ask your family that will change everything. That if you ask this question every day or maybe once a week, it will literally transform your family. I guarantee it'll change your marriage. And it'll change your relationship with your kids or your parents. It'll change everything. And so don't miss next week. It's so powerful. Even if you're not a religious person, even if you're not a church person, you're here. Uh, you know what? Uh, asking this one question will Will, will, will work regardless of your, your, your faith uh, journey or where you are, your belief system. And so don't miss that. Uh, the second week, I mean the third week, um, we're going to talk about conflict in the family. We're going to talk about fighting and quarreling that often happens in families. In fact, uh, I just thought maybe I want to find out if I'm with the right people here and we're, we're on the same page. Uh, how many of you would admit that you fight with your family on occasion? Raise your hand. Oh, interesting. Already half of you have lied, and we're five minutes into this, uh, <laughs> this series already, so <laughs> this is going to be good for you. This is going to be fun. But uh, yeah, the truth is, is there's a lot of trouble uh, in, in our families. We're going to talk about how to handle conflict in a better way. Um, week four, we're going to talk about those family members. You know the ones. The one that uh, maybe you can barely even talk to right now, that there's been some sort of uh, breach in the relationship, some problem that happened, something they did or said, and there's not, you hardly can talk to them. And every time you go to a family reunion or you go home for holidays, it's awkward because of that. We're going to talk about maybe how to navigate that. And then uh, the following week is going to be an experiment. We're going to try something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you everything that Julie and I have learned about parenting from birth to 18 years, because that's as far as we've gone. I got an 18-year-old, but I'm going to just dump it all on you. Um, uh, it's going to be a mind dump. I'm going to back the truck up, and I'm going to say, hey, here's everything that we've learned. Uh, there might not be very many scriptures, if any. In fact, it's probably going to be a terrible sermon. It's going to be a bad mess. I can just warn you. Uh, but it's just our opinion on parenting, and uh, it may not be right. It may not be true for you, but uh, it's just what we think. And uh, the key for the success, though, I think, is that I've been trying to convince Julie to join me 
up here and to do this together. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? Yeah. So today, I am launching a letter camp writing campaign. I want you to email Julie and say, Dear Julie, please help Troy with this message. It will be so much better if you're there than by himself. So anyway, do that. All right, cool. Thank you. So uh, here is what I wanted to start off with and making a statement about what's so challenging with a series like this on families. Um, the challenging thing is, is that each one of our personal experience with families is different. It's very diverse. None of us have had the same experience or had the same family, clearly. Uh, some of us are in blended families. Uh, some of us are more in uh, more traditional families. Uh, some of us are maybe in our second or even perhaps our third marriage. Uh, some of us are in between marriages. Um, some of us are raising kids right now. Uh, some of us are thinking about and praying about raising kids. And, and some of y'all are empty nesters, and you're our heroes. Amen? <laughs> and so uh, we're all just in different places. And so any conversation about family is challenging because each one of our families is, is, is so different. But at the same time, uh, this is a relevant topic because we all have a family. We've all been a part of a family, good, bad, or indifferent. And so um, as I thought about this last week, I thought, boy, what is it that we have in common when it comes to families? And I thought about it, and I only came up with two things. Uh, the first one is, is this, is that um, we all have in common, is that you can pick your friends, and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your family. Amen? <laughs> right? You don't get to pick your family. And we learned that early on. We learned that in middle school. Uh, you know, maybe you stayed over at a friend's house one time, and you're like, wow, this is a little different than what I got going on. I like their role. You know, you're like, man, this family, I'd love to be a part of that family. I mean, they don't seem to have any rules. Uh, my gosh, they, they eat cereal for dinner. You know, they, they, they don't have to pick up their rooms clearly. They sleep in their clothes. Boy, this is, mom, mom is fun, and their dad is never home. Boy, this is heaven, right? I want to be part of this family. And, uh, but uh, none of us got to pick the families that we were born into, uh, and we each had to learn how to navigate the idiosyncrasies of our family members, of our parents, our moms, our dads, our mothers and fathers, and how to navigate that. And in fact, um, when you think about families, it's hard talking about families because the terms that we often use uh, are emotionally charged. So like the word father for some of us uh, means something different, you know. It, it can be tricky for some of us. Father, uh, what you think of when you hear that word father uh, or mother or brother or sister, uh, when you think about those words, they elicit some sort of a, an emotional response of it. Sometimes it's positive, but oftentimes it can be negative. And so that makes it tricky. Um, the other thing that we have in common that I thought about is that we all think I am smarter than the rest of my family, right? We all just believe that. I mean, we're all like, if everyone would just listen to me, this thing would be a whole lot better, right? And again, we learned that in middle school early on. We thought, boy, if dad would just do this or if mom would stop doing that, boy, uh, things would be so much better around here. And so now that you're older uh, and you go to family reunions, you're like, gosh, I wish I could just, can I just have the mic, microphone for 20 minutes? Uh, I'd like to talk to everyone here for just 20 minutes. Uh, I want to say a few things because I think I can fix this thing. I can fix our family. For example, um, Uncle Frank, man, you, brother, you just need, you, it's, it's not complicated. You just need to take a bath, brother. <laughs> That would be better. And, and Sister Sarah, Sister, we all agree. You need to go back to school. You need to dump him and go back to school, right? And, uh, and then, uh, oh, you two. You two just need to say you're sorry to each other, right? You guys need to say you're sorry and things. Everybody agree with me? All right, mic drop. Boom, I just fixed everything. Thank you very much. I'll be back next week, right? That's what we wish we could do because we think that we're smarter. And I, and, and I think we would go, man, uh, if everyone is as smart as us, our families would be would be better. They wouldn't be so jacked up. But the truth is, um, the older you get, the more you realize, the less you know. And you begin to realize, especially that that's true when it comes to family. And uh, because families are complicated. Family dynamics and relationships are complicated. It's, it's not as easy dealing with family members as it is with friends or neighbors. In fact, here's the interesting thing. When you read the scriptures, when you read the Bible, you quickly realize um, there's almost no good examples of families in the Bible. 
I mean, there's no perfect family in the Bible. They are all messed up. Everyone's family is messed up. Even Jesus, the only perfect man who ever lived, his family was messed up. There's a story in there. I don't know if you know about this. One day, uh, Mary and Joseph were walking along, uh, and they were with a bunch of other people, and they were walking along, and Mary turned to Joseph, and she's like, hey, have you, have you seen Jesus recently? And, and Jesus was young. He's maybe 11 or 12, and Joseph's like, no. Come to think of it, I haven't. Have you? And she's like, no. And so they started scrambling. They looked through the whole caravan of people. They couldn't find Jesus. Turns out they found out that they left Jesus at the temple two days earlier. They hadn't seen him for two days. They left the Son of God, the Messiah. How does this happen? You have one job. Take care of the kid. And they left him behind. And so they, they and that apparently didn't mess Jesus up too much, but uh, uh, but even from the very beginning, in the very beginning, uh, we, we see uh, how long did it take the very first family to go off the rails, uh, get fouled up? Uh, not long. Adam and Eve, you know, early on in their relationship, things fell apart and, and stuff kind of got weird. Even though God placed them in a paradise, put them in a place where they lacked nothing, they had everything, uh, they still kind of <laughs> fell apart quickly. Uh, in fact, one of their sons murdered their brother and, and just... I mean, and it just seems like it's all gone downhill from there, right? And so just about every Old Testament story that you read uh, uh, involving a family is bad. Um, the very first civil war in the history of Israel, the nation of Israel, started uh, because of David and his son had a falling out. In other words, thousands of people died <laughs> because, simply because of father and son dispute. And when you read the story and you read that story, you think, gosh, this could have easily gotten fixed. I mean, if they had just done this, I mean, this could have easily been resolved. Why didn't they do that? Because families are hard. They can be complicated, right? And so the Old Testament is filled with a lot of bad examples of families. And then you turn to the New Testament hoping to find some answers. And the truth is, is there's not a lot of specifics in there about family either, uh, how to have a healthy family. Um, Paul and Peter and some of the other writers, they, they insert a few comments here or there uh, about families, but it's not much, really. Uh, in fact, in a minute, I'm going to give you a quick overview of, uh, of what they said. Almost everything that you can find in the New Testament uh, families. And here's the thing. Before I do that and I give that to you, I want to warn you. Um, when you hear what they wrote, especially if you're not a church person, when you hear what they wrote about families, your first response might be, wow. That's kind of old-fashioned. I mean, geez, really? Uh, that sounds like something my grandparents probably bought into, but that doesn't really work in this modern world. That's, that's not gonna, that doesn't really fly here, right? And here's the truth. You're right. I mean, in the world that you and I live in today, what I'm about to share with you, this stuff is considered old-fashioned, and maybe even pie in the sky, just really way out there. But here's what you need to realize. Um, when this stuff was written, when these words were written, they were completely new thoughts. They were brand new to the world. No one had ever wrote these things or said these things. They were, they were new ideas to the Greek and Roman cultures that they were written to. Let me give you an example. Uh, you know, we've talked about this throughout the summer, how back then, uh, 2,000 years ago, women and children uh, were not well regarded. Uh, they were of little value, uh, how they were seen. Uh, women and children uh, were seen as having little more value than maybe cattle and sheep. That's about how they were equated. That's just how the culture was. And, uh, and parents, it's interesting, parents, the way they saw children were different. The parents often didn't even name their children for months because of the high infant mortality rate. Parents would often hold off before naming them and getting attached to them because they weren't sure they would live or not. And so women and children were just kind of seen as a commodity and, and then all of a sudden, uh, Jesus comes along, and he elevated women and children to, uh, to a different status. Uh, he, women were a key part of his ministry. He talked about that. Children, he said, no one, no one can come into the kingdom of God unless they come in with the faith of a child. He elevated that and honored that and celebrated that. And so, um, so what Paul says about uh, families may sound old-fashioned to us. But boy, back then it sounded totally futuristic to them. They were like, wow. I mean, when Jesus died uh, on the cross, uh, Paul would say that he died for everyone. Everyone. Uh, uh, Jewish person and Gentile. Uh, slave or free man. Male, female. Everyone 
was valuable in God's sight when he died. And, uh, and these people now that believed in him were now citizens of his kingdom. They were no longer just citizens of Rome or citizens from this country or, or the world. They were citizens of his kingdom where everyone, where every man, woman, and child had held value and deserved dignity and respect and care. And so that was a game changer. And so as I read to you what uh, these guys said, I want you to think about how disruptive what they said was to that culture and maybe even how uh, refreshing it might have sounded and how life-giving it might have felt to those who were kind of below and now were elevated, what it might have felt like to them and how it sounded. And so Paul, again, is writing to these people and he would say, in light of Jesus, what he did on the cross for all of us, this is how families should relate to one another. This is how families should operate. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, he starts out by talking about children. He gives some instructions. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is good. This is right. Right? And then he goes a little deeper. He goes, honor, honor, esteem, value, place high value on your mother and father. Now, we all agree. We like that one. Amen? Oh, I love that. I'm like, Paul, yeah, honor, kids, honor your mom and dad. Obey them. I'm like, preach it, Paul. Amen. Preach it. I like it. But what he says next, <laughs> it gets a little tricky. It falls off the cliff pretty quick. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul said this. Wives, submit. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is Fitting to the Lord. Uh oh. A little tricky. By the way, if this is troubling some to you, I encourage you to come back next week. I'm going to dive into this. It'll, it'll blow your mind what's really being said here. So come back next week. And then, verse 19, he says this He says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now we look at that and we're like, Why would he need to say that? I mean, that's obvious, right? Well, in that culture, men were harsh. harsh. They were harsh with their dogs. They were harsh with their horses. And they were harsh with their wives. Why? Because she wasn't of much more value than the others. That's just how they saw it. But Paul would say, hey guys, those days are over. <laughs> when Jesus died on the cross for all of us, he died for you and he died for her. And uh, everything changed. And you are to love her and honor her and not be harsh with her. Now again, to us, we hear that, we're like, no duh. No duh. But to them, this was totally brand new and earth shattering. They'd never been told that. And so then Paul continues on in verse 21 and he goes to, to parents. He says, fathers, this is brilliant. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children or they will become discouraged. I, man, there's so much wisdom in that. It's so brilliant. I, it's amazing to me that that passage is in the Bible 2,000 years ago because it's so simple and so true. It's tuned into something in, in, in a father and a child's relationship. Um, uh, as a father, this, is, this New Testament teaching is probably the one that I've probably violated the most. Because it, 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 and, it, and it's almost always unintentional. I don't mean to do it, but I often... <laughs> frustrate and exasperate my kids. Uh, sometimes when I'm correcting them uh, and even when I'm encouraging them, uh, without meaning to, I frustrate them. They get frustrated with me. Why? Because I kind of go on and on and on. You know what I'm talking about? I just keep kind of, you know, and I'm like, do you understand? They're like, yes, Dad. I'm like, but, but, da, da, da. And, they're, and they're, I get it. And they're like, yes, Dad. And they just get frustrated and discouraged, which is the opposite of what I want. Someone once told me that... Um, uh, a mother's words to her kids weigh about 25 pounds. But a father's words to his kids weigh about 500 pounds. There's just something different. A father can say the same thing as a mother, but for some reason their words feel a little heavier to the children. And it can have a different effect. And, uh, and so dads, we need to be careful how we do that, how we process that. So then that's Paul. Then Peter jumps in and he offers us some advice. Uh, he says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Now, again, we hear this and we're like, well, that's just common sense. But again, it was a different time. Back then, um, your parents 
often chose your spouse for you. Remember, it was arranged marriages. Many of the marriages were arranged. The parents would like have some neighbors down the road and they would trade a goat and a couple of chickens so that you could have a wife. <laughs> and they'd bring this wife home and you didn't really have an opportunity to kind of love her and get to know her. And, and it was just kind of an arranged thing and you just got kind of handed this. And so you might not see her as the blessing that she was. And Peter was like, hey, you know what? I, I, you need to be kind to her. You need, to, you need to be considerate because she didn't get to pick you either and you ain't such hot stuff yourself, buster. <laughs> She's in the same pickle as you are. So make the best of it. Be kind and considerate. And then he said this. He said, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner uh, physically. But spiritually, they are co-heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. They may be weaker physically, but listen, spiritually... Same thing. And in that culture, patriarchal culture, uh, the son was always the one who got the inheritance, was always the one that got it, the daughter, nothing. Well, Paul is saying, no, no, no. From now on, our Heavenly Father, you are co-heirs in all of the blessings and all of the, the, uh, the, the, the promises from your Heavenly Father, equal. Uh, so Jesus made you guys equal. You need to treat her as such. And that... Is pretty much it. That's all. <laughs> there, that's most of the teachings in the New Testament on families. Now, in, in case you're not going to come back next week, uh, let me just give you a quick summary so you need, know what to do uh, moving forward. Right? Number one, husbands, love your wives and be considerate to them. Number two, wives, submit to your husbands. Number three, children, obey your parents. And number four, fathers, don't, don't irritate your kids. That's it. Maybe we should just pray and we could go home right now. Amen? <laughs> That's all you need to know. Well, um, here's the problem. And here's the challenge that I want to talk to you today about. And I want you to noodle on for the rest of this week. All of that, as I said, sounds very old-fashioned and very idealistic to us. Right? Having a family that operates that way seems a little pie in the sky to us. And that's the tension. Here's the tension. There's a tension that we all wrestle with. And we're going to wrestle with this over the next few weeks as we talk about families. Here's the tension. There's the ideal, right? There's this, this ideal, this standard that the Bible points us to, right? And so there's the ideal, but at the same time, there's the real. The real, the reality that you and I actually are living in. So we have the ideal family, we have a picture of the perfect family, but the truth is, is that none of us grew up in a perfect family, and none of us have a perfect family. And so there's the ideal, and there's the real, and that's where this tension is. What do we do when we don't live up to the ideal? What do we do when we blow it, and God has told us how to live and be married, and how to raise our kids? What do we do? Well, here's where Jesus is super helpful. Um, this is interesting. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but Jesus constantly, Jesus consistently pointed people to the ideal. He said, this is what you should aim for. Jesus constantly encouraged people to live at a higher level than where they were living. But Jesus never condemned anyone when they fell short of the ideal. He constantly pointed us to this greater place. Jesus never lowered the standard and dumbed it down like a lot of us think that he might have did, that Jesus doesn't really care. He never lowered the standard, but what he did is that he always offered grace when it wasn't attained. Um, a great example of this is Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is talking about adultery, very famous conversation. You might remember this. He was talking to the Pharisees, and in Matthew 5, he said this. He said, you have heard it said... You shall not commit adultery. In other words, it is written, okay, in the law and the prophets and the Ten Commandments, don't commit adultery. Do not have a relationship with a woman who is not your wife or husband, however. But then Jesus says, but I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her. Oh, wow. Again, Jesus didn't lower the bar he raised it higher than it was before. He made it worse. He made it so much worse. I mean, in one fell swoop, every man, Jesus made every man that's ever lived an adulterer. And some of you are like, well, what about women? 
I don't know much about women, uh, but I, what, <laughs> so I can't speak for them, but I can speak for the man. We are all adulterers if that's the standard. Amen? We've all messed up. And so when we hear that, all of us maybe, we hear that, we're like, whoa, whoa, I'm in trouble. I'm an adulterer. Wow, I've broken one of the Ten Commandments, one of the ten. And Jesus would say, yes. Yes, you have. You have missed the mark. But I forgive you. Forgiveness is available. You see, Jesus was this incredible mix. Of, he was the embodiment of grace and truth. Not just one or the other, both at the same time, right? So often Christians are really famous for, we've got the truth and you need to know the truth and here's the truth and you better receive the truth with no grace. And then oftentimes, in more recent times, we see a lot that are a lot of Christians, it's all grace, it's whatever you want to do, it's loosey-goosey and there's no truth. But Jesus was the embodiment of grace and truth. He always pointed people to the ideal, but he didn't condemn when they fell short. Interesting. Perhaps maybe the most ex uh, uh, extreme example of this was when Jesus was speaking to uh, the Pharisees about divorce. Uh, this is a big topic, right? Heavy topic. In Matthew chapter 19. And in Matthew chapter 5, the Pharisees, as they listened to Jesus talk about uh, divorce, they thought they heard him have a contradiction between what he would say or what Moses said. And so they came to trap him. They wanted to come back and trap him in his words. And so in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, it says this, that some Pharisees came to test Jesus and they asked him, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Seemed like you weren't saying that before. Is it lawful for us to divorce? Old Testament says so. And, uh, and uh, here's why uh, they asked this. Because back then, they had a version of the no-fault divorce that makes ours look pretty tame. It was very extreme. And of course, it was completely tilted towards men. I mean, it was totally towards men. A man, all he had to do, he simply to have a divorce, he, for, he could have a divorce for any reason and instantly kick his wife to the curb, to the street. All he had to do was say, I divorce you three times. I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And that marriage was over and the woman had no rights or recourse. <laughs> it was disgraceful. It was disgraceful and Jesus was calling it out and he was challenging them to aim for something higher. And so in verse four, Jesus said this, haven't you read that at the beginning, that back when things were perfect, back when the ideal was there, right? Um, he said that the creator made them male and female, and he said this. He said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. All you 25-year-olds that are still living at home, let me repeat this. A man will leave his mother and father. <laughs> Sometime soon, there'll be a point. You leave, and you'll be united to his wife, and he, get this, and the two will change. Two will become one, one flesh. They are no longer two individuals. They are now one flesh from God's point of view. So Jesus then said, therefore, hear this out, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one, not even Moses, separate him. So this conversation started out as a trap, but now these, these religious leaders were confused and so in verse 7, they said, why then? <laughs> why then, they asked, did Moses allow for a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Why would Moses do that if we're not allowed to do this? What's going on? And Jesus replied, he said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way in the beginning, back when things were perfect. This was not the, when they were ideal. So here's the tension. I, I want you to hear this. Jesus would say, I get it. I understand that nowadays people get tired of each other and uh, people lose interest in each other and that things don't work out. I understand that. But back in the beginning, uh, when God started this, he said that it wasn't good for a man or woman to be alone and he created marriage as a blessing to us, for help, for us. And marriage was supposed to be for life and people were supposed to be committed to each other for life. But that hasn't happened. Um, that hasn't happened. There's the ideal, and then there's the real, right? 
Now, the Pharisees would have heard this, and they might have said, well, but Jesus, marriage is hard, right? Marriage is hard. It's hard staying married to someone, right? Things happen. People change, right? And this ideal of till death do us part, that's not real. That's kind of unrealistic now, right? To which Jesus would say, I know. And that's why I've come. I get that, and that's why I've come. So they probably would have thought, well, wait a second. Let's answer this once and for all. Jesus, is God against divorce or not? What is it? What is it? Is God against divorce? And Jesus would say, yes. Yes, he is. And then they would have went, well, then what's he going to do to all these divorced people? Jesus would say he's not going to do anything to them. Uh, instead, uh, he's going to do something for them. And they're like, well, what's he going to do for them? Um, he sent me here to give my life for them so that they may be healed and restored and forgiven. Now, those Pharisees like us, when they hear this, they're, they're a little confused. They're like, wait a second, God. I mean, uh, is God just letting us off the hook here? I mean, is divorce a thing or not a thing? I mean, is this a rule or is this not a rule? To which Jesus would have said, yes. <laughs> I left it there. And that's the tension. There's a tension that you and I deal with between the ideal and the real. There's a tension that you and I have to navigate between grace and truth. Will we embrace a standard that many of us have or will at some point fall short of? Will we shoot for that standard even though we may fall short? Or will we just simply lower the standard so that we can feel better about ourselves and what we've done? It's pretty clear that we as a society have chosen the second path. And I'm not sure that that's been good for us for our families and for ourselves. I don't think that that's worked out like everybody had hoped. And so um, the problem is here, and, and I know I'm talking to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a Christian, um, I don't think Jesus gave you the option. I, I mean, he clearly told us over and over to aim high, to live at a higher level. And so we must... Uh, manage this tension between what's real and what's really happening around us and this ideal that Jesus put forth that seems like few people will ever attain. We must manage that. And so the question that we've got to ask ourselves when it comes to our family is, is um, should, I, <laughs> should I point my family towards a destination that we may never reach? Should I challenge my kids and myself and my family to to aim for something so big and so great that uh, we might not make it, we might not live up to it? Or should I simply just redefine the terms and dumb it down and redefine what normal and what a good family looks like? Think about this. Um, every divorced parent in this room, uh, I know your hearts, just like any married parent, but especially divorced parents, you want your kids to have a better life than you had. And so, I would suggest to you, normalizing divorce is probably not a good answer. It's probably not the right thing. Saying divorce is something, yeah, like everybody is. I mean, do you want your daughters to marry men who will go into their marriage assuming that in a few years they can easily trade up if they feel like it? Is that what you want? Uh, every single mom here, I believe this, every single mom, every single mom is praying that her daughter will one day meet a man who will love and cherish her till death do they part. That's the dream. That's your prayer. That's your hope. And, 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 and every single mom prays that her son will find a role model who will show them how to honor the women that are in their life, to treat them as children of God, as daughters of God, as princesses from God. I mean, that's what we want, right? 
And so for the next few weeks, um, uh, we're going to try to manage this tension, uh, this tension between seeking the ideal in a less than ideal world. We're going to figure that out. We're gonna, I'm going to encourage you to dream big and to, to reach for God's best for your family, knowing that you might fall short here or there, but uh, knowing that God's grace is sufficient for you. You'll reach high knowing that God has got your back when you fail. If you're single here today, uh, my hope is, is that uh, this series will give you maybe a new picture, a renewed picture of what could be. And maybe according to God, what should be in your family's future. And that you realize that you don't have to settle like everyone else and do things like everyone else to get what you want. That you can believe that God is in it to help you win it, to have a life and a love that lasts forever. And if you're in a family where maybe uh, the ideal seems out of reach for you right now because things have kind of fallen apart, things haven't turned out the way. Um, by the way, you're in the majority. And, uh, but so were those first century believers. <laughs> they, they, this was totally new to them. These, these goals were totally new to them. But they had decided to embrace the teachings and the examples of Jesus. And with that, they began to aim for something seeming, some seemingly unattainable goal. But at the same time, they clung to a seemingly unimaginable grace. It's like they had two vines. I want to reach for the best, but I'm believing that God's got my back when I don't make it, and I can swing between those two. And that's the tension that we must live with and navigate for the sake of our families. And so my hope is, is that you'll hang with us over these next few weeks as we try, each one of us try to create a perfect family, okay? Is that okay for an introduction? I hope you think about this and, and meditate on this next week uh, and over this next week and we'll come back and we'll get a little more practical. Let me pray for you and I'll let you go because I know we have pulled pork sandwiches outside. I'm aware of that. Father, I thank you uh, for uh, your goodness and we thank you for the truth that you've laid out. You know what's best for our lives uh, and, it, and it often seems hard to us, especially when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world. Uh, but you know, and, and we thank you for that. But we also thank you for your grace. And when we fall short, um, you're, you love us and you don't condemn us and you're ready to pick us up and get us back on track. And so as we navigate and talk about families over the next few weeks, I pray that you would help us to navigate that. I pray that no one will feel condemnation for where maybe they've fallen short because that's not in Christ Jesus. That's from the enemy. We'll be convicted and be, uh, make a new decision to aim higher for ourselves, for our marriages, for our families, God. So help us to do that, I pray. Um, help us to realize that there's no perfect family, uh, that this family thing you invented, uh, man, it's pretty good, but it's kind of clunky too. Just like church, it's, it's pretty good, but it can be clunky. Someone once said the church is like Noah's Ark. It's got a bunch of stinky animals in there. It must stink, but it's the only thing floating. <laughs> and uh, in the same way, the family is one of those things that you've given us to help us make it through life together. And we thank you for our family, and we pray that you'd help us help our family and be a part of the answer and not just the problem. Lord, I pray you'd help us do that. In Jesus' name. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen.